This is happening today. Well, let's move the Bible out. Battle, conflict. You are going to have to decide what side of the fence you're on. You're going to have to decide. Do I believe in Jesus or do I kind of like, well, not really, some of that stuff. Whew. So what Christ is saying, all right, what Paul's saying is the foundation of truth. Then look what he says next. He says, verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stone. Everyone say gold, silver, and precious stone. Gold, silver, and precious stone. And then say wood, hay, straw. <laughs> Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work what sort it is. You're going to stand before God and you're going to bring all your works. And all your works are going to be there. And the God's fire is going to apply to it. And when the fire is applied to it, some of it's going to burn up. And some of it's going to come through like a precious stone. See, when you apply fire to gold, silver, or precious stones, they get more shiny. That means God approves. When you put wood, hay, and stubble in fire, it burns up. Some of y'all are going to come to God with all the stuff that you did, and it's going to go, poof, the magic dragon. <laughs> it's going to blow up because it's wood, hay, stubble, and you get no reward. You do not want that. You want to come to God and have God tested by fire, and it come through shiny like precious stones because it was done in a way that honored him. And we're going to talk about what that means in a minute. Look at number seven. We are examined not to determine salvation, but rewards. We are examined not for salvation. This is not a salvation thing. In Islam, and here's a perfect example. In Islam, you have the Quran. You got the Quran because Gabriel supposedly spoke to Muhammad in a cave Nobody was there and gave him the Quran. And Gabriel supposedly got it from Allah. But no one's ever spoken to Allah. No one's ever seen Allah. Can't confirm his existence. We only know what Muhammad told us. Gabriel told him, got told by Allah. You can pray to Allah today, but he's not going to talk to you because he doesn't talk to you. Okay? So in Islam, you believe the Quran... And your leader, if you ever heard that word sectarian violence is going on in Iraq, you have different sects, people who believe this about the Quran and people who believe this around the Quran. Well, those sects are fighting each other. That's sectarian violence. They're fighting because they have different views about the Quran. They don't have direct access to Allah. They have access to the Quran and to the imam or their leader, their spiritual leader. But nobody has access to Allah. Even those leaders don't have access to Allah. They pray to him, but he doesn't talk to them. One big reason, because he ain't there. <laughs> now, you could argue, well, how could you say that? Well, well, this Bible says there's only one God. And number two, if he's there, how come he ain't talking to him? I mean, if you're a God, why, how come you ain't talking to your people? Why would you do that? And number two, this Bi th their book says, in, in essence, when I die, the only way I'm going to know if I go to heaven is that my Good deeds outweigh my bad. Well, this Bible says that that is not how you get salvation. You get salvation by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man can boast about how many good deeds he has. Well, those two things contradict each other, so they both can't be right. The same God can't say you are saved by grace, not by works, and then you are saved by works, not by grace. The same God can't say that. That's a contradiction. That God is confused if there's one God saying that. So you can't have that. So the reason they blow themselves up and die is because that's the only way they can guarantee themselves heaven. That's why they do it. Does this Bible say that? Absolutely not. You have conflict. Someone has to be wrong. Now, so this is not for salvation. It's for works, for rewards. Look what it says in verse 14. If anyone's works which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If any, say reward. reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer a loss. Say loss. loss. But he will self and be saved, yet so as through the fire. So what he's saying is that when, you, when your works are tested, if it passes, you get a reward. And next week we're going to talk more about the reward is and why you need to want it. I'll just tell you this. It's going to affect how you worship God. 
And if your deeds suffer, burnt up, you suffer a loss. Say loss. loss. A loss implies that it could have been a gain. In other words, the loss implies that you had an opportunity for it to be a reward. So when God tests your words, your deeds, you're having opportunities every day to get a reward, and sometimes you get a loss because of what you do. Now, before I tell you what you need to do to make the losses into gains, the losses into rewards, let me say this. If you live 40, 50, 70, whatever the years you are, and you have these many opportunities, and you decide to do whatever it is to make them all a loss, this is how many rewards you get. Same person, same number of opportunities. He makes a different decision. They get these many rewards. Well, the person with this many rewards and the person with this many rewards have two different experiences in heaven. The person with this many rewards and the person with this many rewards have two different experiences in heaven. So you have to decide, do you want to have this kind of experience in heaven or this kind? Now, you may not care. You may say, hey, I'm in heaven. I don't care. Well, let me tell you why that's selfish. It's not about you. God would say, I want you to have these, I want you to want this many rewards because this is, this is going to indicate how much you love me. It's not about you. It's about how much you love me. I want to get that many rewards because in order for me to get them, I got to love God. Now, and it'll enable me to express that love differently than now. Am I saying that when you get to heaven, you're going to be all bummed out? Oh, man, I ain't get a lot. This is whack, and I'm here forever. This is messed up. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that at all. As a matter of fact, I don't know. You know, some of us in this room grew up, and, and y'all are still young, so you're still kind of growing up in your parents' house, but some of us in this room grew, grew up in what we might today refer to as ghetto. Okay? And what I mean by ghetto is that, and as you get older and get your own house, it'll be more clear to you that you will look back on how you grew up and say, man, that was below what I have now. But when you were in it, you didn't know any different. I mean, it's like that's all you knew. And my point is this, is that when you go to heaven, you're going to be so overwhelmed with joy, it's not necessarily that you're going to know any different. But that still ain't the point. Because it's really about when I get to heaven, I want to be able to thank God to the maximum capacity that is available. And I want to be able to worship God and have the best time and, and, and be able to honor him the most I, I could possibly have that's available to me. Why? Because I love him so much. I don't want to just skate in and, and just be, you know, just get the, the, uh, uh, the stock crowns. I want to get, I want to get rewarded. I want my life to be, I want my life to be worthy of him saying, you were the bomb on earth. Can you imagine God saying that? Angels singing, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that brother's going to be up there. <laughs> we'll probably see him way up in the corner. He'll be out. <laughs> and just imagine you walking up. Matter of fact, matter of fact, somebody raise your hand and tell me your name. Just anybody. Just raise your What's your name? Yeah. Kevin. What, somebody, what are you? Mary. Mary. Dadua. What? <laughs> How do you spell? D-A-U-D-U-A-A. -A. Dadua. What is that? What is that? South Pacific Island of Tonga. Tonga. <laughs> Tadua, how many languages do you speak? Uh, about three. About three. <laughs> English? Uh, Tonga and Samoan. Samoan, okay. We speak about one. <laughs> God's going to say, Tadua, and you'll be walking out. And he's going to say, I made Tonga. God made Tonga. He didn't call it that. But he made it. And you imagine God saying, you were the bomb. Wouldn't you love that? Man, you did such a good job. I threw everything I could at you, and you still trusted me. 
You didn't flinch. You know, God, God has me in a situation in my life and I'm in a challenge in my life that is the biggest challenge I've ever had in my life. It is so exciting. Biggest in my life, no question. It's ridiculous. It's impossible with a capital letters. And the sermon that he is developing out of it is called Don't Flinch. You know what it means to make you flinch? You know when you're paying chickens at somebody? Don't flinch. And, and God's going to say, man, I try to make you flinch. I try to make you, I try to make, break you down. Not for evil, because I want to see how much you could take. Matter of fact, I wanted you to see how much you could take. And you were the bomb. When you love God to say that, that's my version of, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> Are you feeling me? <clears throat> On an individual basis. So this is going to be for rewards. Now, what determines... So he's going to say your name, by the way. That's my point. He's going to say your names and say your names and say your names. He'll call you forward. And I have a theory, again, it could be wrong, that the, the name that's in the book of life, your name that's in the Lamb's book of life, ain't the name your mother gave you. I think it's a different name. And I think that that name describes what God's plan for you was. And it's compatible with God, what, to God's talents and gifts for your life. Like, my, my name could easily be Mouth. You know what I'm saying? It could be something like that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> say Mouth. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm not saying you say Mouth. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying he could say Mouth, come forward. You know what I mean? Like, hey, that, hey, that's you, man. That's you. You the Mouth. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> What's up? That you know, <laughs> no, nah, I'm gonna be walking like uh, uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna it, it, it's gonna be something I can't describe because I ain't seen it. Um, <laughs> what determines whether you get wood, hay, and stubble or jewels? I'm a CSI fan. <gasps> Ooh, <sorry>. <laughs> <sighs> I only watch CSI Las Vegas. <laughs> I only, and I don't, we, my wife and I, we, we watch every Thursday. We don't know why that we don't have any interest in New York. I'm from New York or Miami. Um, we never seen those shows. We just see the, you know, the average, we just never watch them. But, watch the, matter of fact, I was in the airport once. I don't know where I was, and this lady goes, Are you on TV? And I was like, Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I said, No. She said, No, no, you're on TV. I said, No, I'm not. Well, who do you look like? <laughs> look like me. <laughs> you look like somebody. We were standing in line for, to get a ticket. So, you know, we were standing there for, she was in front of me for too long. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you look like somebody. I don't, I don't know. You look like that guy on CSI Miami. Now, I've never seen it. I didn't know, I don't know who the dude is. Is she talking about? The dude don't look like me. The dude got shot last week. Anyway, he's dead. But, uh, <laughs> anyway. I'm a CSI Las Vegas, and in CSI, crime scene investigation, they go to the crime scene and they look for evidence, forensic evidence. They look for DNA evidence and bodily fluids, blah, blah, blah. They look for footprints, try to match the footprints with shoes, tire prints to cars. They look for chemicals on the walls, you know, how long the bug been dead, all that kind of stuff. Then they have the autopsy. But they look for fingerprint evidence. Fingerprint evidence determines who touched something. When you stand before God, he's looking for fingerprint evidence. Did you touch your life or did he touch your life? That is what he's looking for. When you come before God, that's all he wants to know. He is going to look for his fingerprints. I was, uh, there's a story in the Bible. It is in 1 Samuel chapter 6. The Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines from the Jews. And the Philistines were cursed because they stole it. They were getting tumors. They were dying. And so God, the Philistine says, Israel, take it back. So this guy named Uzzah was transporting the Ark of the Covenant. It was on a cart. And these ox were pulling it. And it went into a pothole and started to slide off the cart and Uzzah put his hand on the ark, and God killed him. 
You know what God said? Don't put your hand on my stuff. Do you know that your life is God's stuff? All your relationships, all your talents, your body, everything you own, your money, your time, your car, it all belongs to God, and he don't want you putting your hand on his stuff. So when you stand before God, he's going to examine how much of your life you put your hand on. In other words, what did you do for you? With your strength, your power, your ideas, this is my idea. I want to do this. This is about me. Got your handprints all over it. He's looking for his fingerprint where you said, no, God, you do it. Hmm. There's a difference. Matter of fact, I know this is all about the baby seat. This is the essence of a Christian. How much of God's hands on your life and how much of your hands on your life? How much of your life do people say, that was God? I was doing an interview with, with Channel 4, the Padre station. You know, Jane, she does interviews, all the, the uh, Padre stuff. She, and she did a thing on, uh, interview me for like, like six months ago. And she was talking about the church and charges, all that kind of stuff. And she says, so, Miles, you're building a big church in Palm Island, blah, blah, blah. You have a great congregations growing. All these How are you paying for this? And I said, God. And she went. <laughs> I mean, she didn't do it like that. I'm just kind of exaggerating. Okay, you know, yes, thank God. Okay, but, you know, really. Can, can you break it down a little bit? And I said, well, you know, last fall we needed $6 million, $5 million. A guy walked up to me, didn't know. He ended up tapping on the shoulder. We had a conversation. Next thing, boom, 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 bang, bang. He wrote a check for $5 million, $5.5 million. And she went, that's God. And I went, that's what I just told you. <laughs> um. Do you know that God does stuff like that in your life and wants to every day? It doesn't have to be five million. That's just one incredible example. But he wants to do stuff in your life where you just go, I don't understand how that happened. I don't understand how that happened. I have a calendar. I have a journal. I write prayers in just about every day. And I have a, a, another journal that is brag on God journal. I have a date, 1107. I write what God did that day. 1207, every single day. I already got my one amazing miracle for today. I ain't going to tell you what it is because it's personal, but I got it. Because I'm tracking and acknowledging what God is doing. What's God doing in your life? We have five kids in our family. My mother had five kids within six years. My, my sister is 50 weeks older than me. Before she turned one, I was born. Then my brother, then my sister, then my brother. So my, my mom had a seven-year-old, a six-year-old. Seven, six, four, three, two, something like that. Like, it was just blah, blah, blah. My mother is four, eleven and a half. My mother worked full time. My dad worked full time. And we all lived in a three bedroom house. We had a little, little tiny house in New York. And we used to go upstate to the mountains on vacation. We had a station wagon, it'd be five of us. Two parents, seven people, grandma, uncle, and all the sleep bags. Car would be like a lowrider back then. <laughs> Drive two and a half hours up to the mountains. So we're driving back one day, and the axle under the car snapped. But it didn't break totally. It was like that. My father looks under the car. We're two hours away from home, up in the mountains. Ain't nobody around for nowhere. Nothing but trees and deer. <laughs> I, oh, is that, oh, I thought you were somebody else. The lady who's always laughing. Where you been? So, so she, so she, I mean, so he looked under the car and it was snapped. And he's like, I have no choice. I have to drive two hours to get my, I mean, we were little kids. What was he going to do? We're out in the mountains. He drove two hours all the way down the mountains, all the way through New York City. And then he's talking about driving through Beirut, potholes, blah, clang, clang, holes in the street, big old holes like this big. He drives, gets up to my street two hours later. R drives in front of my house, makes a three-point turn, parks in front of the house, turns the car off. Ooh, the thing goes snap. <laughs> snap. He's like, another time when I was a kid, we, we had, it was winter time, it was snowing. We're all five in bed sleeping. 
for us to have heat in our house, you had to have oil put in a tank underneath your lawn. It was a valve coming out of the ground. So the oil truck would come up and take the hose across your lawn and put oil in your tank. We had no oil. It was snowing. My father had no money. And he was sitting in the window just looking outside. It was night. And he says, my family's going to die. Out of the blue, oil truck drives up in front of the house. This is nighttime. Walks up to the tank, puts oil in the tank, drives away. Never sent a bill. He never called him. Just came out of nowhere. To this day, he has no idea. God, what is God doing in your life? Two ways you can increase his fingerprints on your life. Number one, make sure your heart's intent is to glorify God. Say intent. Amen. Your heart is, has to intend to make God look good. Example, I use Starbucks because we all know Starbucks, Ladyville. You go to Starbucks and you order a triple mocha frappuccino latte Macarena twist. <laughs> you pay $12. <laughs> then you walk to the end of the counter and you wait five minutes, 10 minutes, 35 minutes later, they call you and they give you a hot chocolate. And you go, oh no, you did not. And they go, you ordered a hot chocolate? She said, no, I ordered a triple mocha, frappuccino, latte, macarena, twist. You gave me hot chocolate. And she cops an attitude with you, yells at you, and fronts you off in front of all the other patrons, embarrasses you, and she's wrong. Before you speak a word, you have to ask God. I want to honor you right now. If you decide to honor God, it will change what you do versus if you decide to defend yourself. You can't defend yourself. You are not defendable. You are a sinner. It has nothing to do with you're right or wrong in this situation. God has you in this situation, and he wants to be honored through this situation. And if you want God's hand to be on your life, you have to honor him in this situation. God cannot honor you if you do not honor him. So you have to say, God, I want to honor you and glorify you in this situation. But can I do it in five minutes? No, I want you to do it now. In everything you do in your life, in everything you say, and why you take the classes you take, who you hang out, what shows you watch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you have to ask, I, I tell God, I want to glorify you in this. When you get dressed, ladies, when you get dressed, when you go to the store, first let me tell you that the people who design the clothes design the clothes for sexual reasons. I mean, I'm sure you know that, even though girls are very ignorant to what their clothes do to guys. Not completely, but almost. Clueless. <laughs> you have to ask yourself a question. What is the intent of me wearing these pants this low and this shirt this high? What's my intent? Is it to glorify God? Well, that's right, and God made my body, and I want people to see it. If your intent is not to glorify God, you shouldn't wear it. If your intent is not to glorify God in what you say, don't say it. If your intent is not to glorify God with people you hang out with, don't hang out with them the way you're hanging out with them. It always has to go to glorifying God and never you. If you say this is about me, then your fingerprint's on it and you ain't getting rewarded for it and you're probably going to lead you into sin. But if your intent is to glorify God, then it's a whole different ballgame. How do you do that? By faith. Point number two. First, you have to intend to glorify God, and then you have to go about it based on faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You have to go about it by faith. Let me give you the Macarena uh, uh, illustration. You go to order the triple twist, mocha, frappuccino, latte, Macarena. Isn't a, fra a frapp and a latte two different things? 
All right, it don't matter. Just, just drink as a blend. And, you, and, and, it's a, and it's whatever. And then you go, hour later, 35 minutes later, she says she gives you a, she gives you a, a cocoa, a, a, a hot chocolate. And then you say to God, God, I want to honor you. I want to glorify you. And God says to you, amidst everybody looking at you because she just yelled at you, gave you the wrong drink, she's wrong. You're embarrassed. And God says to you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at her, smile, and tell her you're sorry. You probably made a mistake. And you'll take the God chocolate and tell her to keep the $12. And you're like, no, you did not. <laughs> That's what I want you to do. And take a deep breath. <sighs> breathe. Turn. Smile. And tell you sorry. I'm sorry. I will take the chocolate. You have a nice day. And use my money to feed the poor kids in Africa, because that's how much money I gave you. And you know what God does in heaven? You just pass the test. Is that the essence of Christianity? Yes. Yes. I was talking to somebody the other day about there was a study done that 15, only 15% of people with exceptionally high IQ are successful in life, only, life, only 15%. 15% of people with exceptionally high IQ are successful in life. Why? Because high IQ is not what makes you successful. What makes people successful is emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, being able to assess the people around you and assess how to move through your environment to get stuff done. You can have book knowledge all you want. You can have context all you want. But if you can't get along with people, it's going to be a harder road for you. Same thing's true with the Bible. You can go to church all you want, but if you don't have faith and you don't trust God, you ain't going to be blessed. You can, you can read the Bible all you want, but if you don't obey it by faith, you're not going to be blessed as much. This is all about faith. And when you stand before God, God's eyes, of, you know, in fact, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are like flames of fire. He's going to look into your life, and he's going to examine to look with his fingerprint on everything you did. The intent of your heart, not only what you did, but the intent of your heart. Because you know when you were a little kid and you see with little kids, they have a fight with their brother and sister or a friend down the street, and their mother will say, say you're sorry. And they'll go, I'm sorry. <laughs> say it like you mean it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell them you love them. I love you. <laughs> Is it hard in it? Well, if mama knows that, you know that. Surely God knows that. I don't know if y'all are too young to have seen the Superman in black and white. Y'all see the Superman in black and white? Yes, anybody? Okay, Superman in black and white, unlike the Superman of today, old school superheroes blow these dude dudes away. The Superman in black and white, he was able to see through walls. Light would come from his head like a beam of light and go right through the wall. Y'all remember that? If you haven't seen it, you ain't seen nothing. This was, this was Superman. He would see Lois Lane all tied up. And then he would bust through the wall, it was made of styrofoam, and he would sell it, save him. <laughs> suit man today in the color, you know, the, the, red and, the, the red and blue suit with the S on his chest. You know, he, you have to have your whole name on your body, you have to have one letter. But anyway, he, he can't see through walls. He can't, he can't see through walls like the old suit man. When Jesus looks at you, his eyes aflame look right into your life, and he looks at the intent of your heart. And he's going to know. Is his fingerprint... Was, just, was his fingerprint on your intent or not? My challenge to you is this is very simple. Is that you would say, Lord, I want to, when I get to heaven, I want to be rewarded. I want you to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want to come to heaven and have all the things I did that I thought I was doing good, the things I thought I was sacrificing, in, be burnt up and be worthless. You know what's really sad is that you, you're making sacrifices, but you're doing it with the wrong attitude. You're like that little kid. I love you. I'll go to church, all right. Look, I went to church. God's like, you should have stayed home. You just wait, I mean, is it? don't even say you're a Christian. When, you, when you're serious, let's go. Because you do with me more harm than good. But when your heart's in it, 
<laughs> and, and let me tell you, and I tell you this from experience, because I've seen miracles. I've seen medical miracles. I've seen financial miracles. I've seen spiritual, emotional, mental, life change miracles, countless. It works. People, and I'm not saying just for me and other people, when people step out by faith and say, God, I want to make you look good, and God says, I want you to do it by this. And by the way, God is going to tell you to do stuff that you can't do. Matter of fact, everything God tells you to do is going to be beyond you. That's the prerequisite for it being faith. If you say, well, I don't know how to do that, and I don't think I, that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. God is going to always put you in a place. That's why I tell you, I'm going through this biggest thing. God, said, God got me in this place, and I'm thinking, how did I get in this place? He says, I put you there. I tricked you. God tricked me. and th That's my words. And what I mean by that is God told me this, he told me this, he told me this, he told me this, and then all those things I thought were true, he removed them and left me here. Now, is that deceitful by God? No, because I don't know the whole story yet. I don't know the whole story yet. I was supposed to, two, three years ago, I went to Hawaii to speak in these high schools, to do, and we had a, a event, some outreaches over there. And in one of the high schools, they asked me to come back and do the graduation in like six weeks. So I said, yes. So I said, you know, we're going to give you this. We're going to pay you tickets, blah, blah, blah. So I went out and bought a ticket. And then I upgraded. My wife and I were going to stay, so I put extra money on the ticket to get a first-class seat because I wanted to chill. And, and uh, my friend who has a, a connection with a limo company, he gave us a limo because we had to go to Orange County. So we were like, ready. We called and they say, we canceled you. I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just, <laughs> they said, I'm sorry, we canceled you. Matter of fact, we're not going to call you back and tell you why. And they just disappeared. So why not stuck with all this, you know, these expenses? We thought they were going to reimburse us. And they just, so I got tricked. What did me and my wife do? We went anyway. <laughs> it was the best time, one of the best times we ever had. It was a good trick. What God has done for me is he'll say, do this, do this, do this. And then everything I just stepped on, he removes. I'm out here all by myself. He says, you wouldn't have got there if I didn't tell you all that other stuff. Did he lie? No, because that other stuff, he comes around, he does stuff in people's lives, whatever, whatever. And, it's, and, and, and that's, when God does that to you and puts you there, that's when you know God's going to do something. Because it was about him, not you. You didn't create the dilemma. He created the dilemma. And now he wants to see what you're going to do. So if you walk by faith, okay, God, I'm going to try it. Okay, God, I'm going to try it. I trust you. I'm going to trust you. And then he says, now I really want to test you. Now, why is all that important? It's not a game. Why does God do that? Because the more you see him move on your life, the more you can trust him, the bigger things he can, he can trust you. Because God is only going to glorify himself through faith and through people who trust him, who can look into the unknown, into the darkness, and see a light. So he creates and develops trust in your heart. And if you ever go through a Frappuccino Latte Mocha experience and a girl curses you out and you walk out there, you go, what was that all about? It was about at least this one thing that you now know you can get cursed out and it won't kill you. You can say sorry even when you're right and forgive somebody even when they're wrong and swallow your pride and it won't kill you. At least that. And imagine what your life would be like if you really believed that. Imagine what, you, imagine what your life would be like if you didn't walk around having to be right all the time. Having to prove yourself all the time. Imagine what life would be like. You'd have so much less pressure. It don't matter. Man, look at it. You can laugh at me all you want. It don't bother me. Six and zone and break my bone and they'll never hurt me. It don't bother me. God, what do you want me to do? I want you to go over there and do this. You're going to risk your reputation. No problem. God, what you want me to do? I want you to go over there and witness that person. They may laugh at you. No problem. God, what you want me to do? I want you to go over here and give away everything you had and trust me. Okay, no problem. God, I want you to go over here. I never did it before, but no problem. That's the person God can use. But if everything for you is a condition, well, God, you know, I never did it. Well, God, I need this. He's like, oh, come back to me when you're ready to serve. You want God to go to God of heaven? God's going to be, and this is why I don't know what it's going to be like, but I hope it's like this. I hope that you and Jesus can sit down and just laugh. You remember this? 
Man, you were so scared. I was watching you. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> I had you going, man. I had you thinking you were going to get left out to drive, but I had your back, man. I had your back. It was Jesus talking to you. You remember that girl you had a crush on? She was no good, brother. <laughs> she was no good. You remember that time you almost killed yourself? You remember that time you almost killed yourself? I was standing right there. I was standing right there. And you know what? You almost killed yourself. But I knew that you could take it. And at the last minute, you dug deep and realized the strength I gave you. All of that he knows. And I'll end with this. If you knew how the end of your life ends up in heaven, if you could see yourself in heaven, it should change the way you live now. Well, let me tell you how it ends up in heaven. So stop worrying about now. Stop worrying about it. If you never asked Christ to be your Savior, you need to now, and we'll give you the opportunity. Because when you ask Christ to be your Savior, all your sin is gone, and your life starts over all over again. The Bible says we're all sinners, and the penalty of sin is death. By the way, if you're not a sinner, this whole Bama seat doesn't apply to you. There's a great white throne judgment where you will be judged with no negotiations and you go to hell forever and no second chance. But the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, forgiven, and he will remember your sin no more as it pertains to salvation. Ever again, we'll never bring it up. Now all you got to do is work on your rewards. So in a minute, we're going to pray and give you opportunity to ask Christ to be your Savior. Because if you say no to Christ then you're on your own. So let me encourage all of you in two things. One, if you're not saved, please accept Christ to be your Savior. And two, if you're saved, which most of you are, every day, look for God's fingerprint. Put God's fingerprint. Take your hands off your life and ask God how he wants you to live in those areas and watch miracles happen. Let's all bow for a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. Thank you so much for your goodness. And I pray we would, we would trust you every step of the way that we would intend in our heart to make you look good. No matter what our attitude is, we pray, I pray that we would intend in our heart to make you look good. And I pray the intent of all of our hearts would be to use this information for your glory. But if you've never asked Christ to be your Savior, if you have never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin and you want to tonight, pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe my sin is wrong. But I believe you love me. I believe you died and rose from the dead. Jesus, please forgive me. Be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, God. As all of our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer to ask Christ to be your Savior, in a minute I'm going to ask you to stand up. And by standing up, you are acknowledging his forgiveness. You are acknowledging receiving eternal life. So now with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, if you prayed that prayer and you're saying, yes, Lord, please forgive me of my sin, I'm going to ask you right now just to stand up in your seat and acknowledge his forgiveness. God bless you. Stay standing, please. God bless you. 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 God bless all of you. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. Jesus is asking you, yes, I want to forgive you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Very good. Now I'm going to ask all y'all who are standing to do one more thing. As we welcome you to the family of God, 
We're going to ask all y'all who are standing to walk out of your seat and come on down to the altar. Let's give them a hand as they come on down. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>